It's time for Tycoons of Small Biz, spotlighting the true backbone of the American economy, the true tycoons of business in America, the owners, founders, and CEOs of small businesses. The show's hosts, Austin Peterson and Landon Mance, are registered representatives of Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker-dealer, member SIPC, and registered investment advisor. The views expressed by your hosts, Austin and Landon, are not necessarily the views of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Let's lean in as Austin and Landon connect with this week's Tycoons. Good afternoon, Tycoons, and welcome to today's episode of Tycoons of Small Biz. I'm here as always, Austin Peterson, one of your hosts, and the other host, Landon Mance, coming to us from Las Vegas, Nevada. We are excited to have in or on the show with us today, Dominic Rinaldi with Sun Acquisitions coming to us live from Chicago, the, the frozen tundra of Chicago, Illinois. Dom, thank you for joining the show today. Hey, Austin and Landon, thank you so much for having me. Pleasure to be here. I, I shouldn't have said the frozen tundra, that's Green Bay. So I, I apologize. I'm sure you're a Bears fan and you're also lick, licking your wounds from this last week's uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm actually not. Uh, I'm not originally from here. I'm originally from New York. Uh, so worse, uh, I'm, a, I'm a New York Giants fan, uh, lifelong, oh. and uh, it's been a rough road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Giants actually seem to be up and down, right? I mean, there were a couple years there with Eli where it was really good and things yep. were really great. But uh, if you look at the totality of your lifetime, it's probably a pretty tough team to be a fan of. Yeah, you know, we had Phil, we had Phil Sims, uh, who took us to a Super Bowl, uh, and Jeff Hostetler and, uh, and Bill Parcells, obviously, Hall of Fame coach. So there were some good years along the way, but uh, certainly no dynasties during my lifetime. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I wouldn't want to bring up the New England Patriots, because I'm sure that's a sore subject. Or the Boston Red Sox. Uh, yeah, well. <laughs> you know, I'm a Yankee, I'm a life, I'm, you know, Giants and Yankees. <laughs> well. We, we may need to end this one a little bit early because I'm a lifelong Red Sox fan. So. I knew I knew that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're excited to have you on the show today, Dom. And, and what we typically do is, is start by having our guests tell a little bit about themselves personally. So tell us a little bit about your family where, you know, obviously it sounds like you're, you're originally from New York, found your, your way to Chicago and just kind of give us that background as to how you got to where you are today and, and what's most important in your life. Yeah, so uh, as, as I stated, originally from New York, um, after school, uh, joined Sprint Corporation uh, back in the early days of telecom when it first got deregulated. And, you know, grew up in that corporation, spent 14 years there. After 14 years left, uh, entered the world of venture capital backed firms. I actually joined a firm that was the second company in the world to ever take a hotel reservation over the internet and uh, was part of a couple of teams that raised a fair amount of venture capital money, I think over a hundred million dollars of venture capital money, built a couple of those businesses, unfortunately filed to go public uh, just prior to the first market crashes. But I always tell people it was sort of my MBA. Like I learned <laughs> so much in that process. The outcome wasn't there, but the learning uh, was invaluable. And from a very early age, always had an itch to own my own business and um, found myself at a point in life, my early 40s, where I was in transition and I decided, you know, that would be a good time to, to maybe you know, launch into business ownership. And long story short, I went out to buy a business, couldn't quite find what I was looking for, but became enamored with this cottage industry of M&A inter intermediaries who were helping people buy and sell businesses. And it really was cottage 17 years ago because it, it wasn't really what it is today. You'd call on owners and, and they had no idea that people existed to help them buy and sell businesses back then. And I became enamored with that industry, found an opportunity. It was very small. I bought it. And here I am 17 years later, um, having taken that business to a completely different level. And we specialize in helping people, you know, buy and sell privately held companies. It's been, it's been quite a ride and, uh, you know, gave me the financial and personal freedom that I had always been looking for and, um, and really thankful for that. 
Yeah, that's awesome. I, I mean, it is crazy to think that just 20 years ago, what you're talking about doing, it's mainstream now, but it really wasn't mainstream back then. And, you know, even today, the message certainly isn't out as much as it as it should be, right? I mean, there are way too many businesses in this country that just shut down when the owner decides he doesn't want to be involved any longer and doesn't realize that there's some value that can be that can be had there, so to speak, if he connects with the right people to get there, he or so she. True. So yeah. true. I think the stat is, you know, over 75% of owners don't prepare for an exit, uh, which is amazing to me, given all of the information out there about how you can prepare and the things you should do to move the needle. Uh, it's still an alarming number. Yeah, yeah, it is. And Landon and I see it every day in our business as well. I mean, our main focus is helping those business owners prep for that eventual exit. So growth and exit and, and be ready to, you know, exit in a tax efficient manner is what we do every day. And obviously, it's it, we involve people like yourself to help along the way with that as well. So I do have to hit on the fact that you've got that background for your podcast, m and Unplugged. So hopefully you're not judging us too harshly with our podcasting abilities today, but we'd love to hear about m and Unplugged and how long you've been doing that and what that's meant for you as well. Yeah. So, you know, after uh, 16 some odd years of, of doing this, the number one pitfall, which I've just talked about, is that people don't prepare for an acquisition, whether it's buying or selling. Time and time again, we'd come across people and uh, their backs were up against the wall. They had to have a transaction done and they really didn't prepare. And I thought that we could do our part with all of our experience and knowledge. My firm you know, has been around for over 20 years and we've been involved in over 400 M&A transactions. So we have a lot of experience across a broad range of injuries, industries I thought we could take all that knowledge and experience and help educate business owners and entrepreneurs about how to be prepared. And, and in thinking about how we could do that in a really broad way, podcasting really came, came back to us time and time again. And so about 18 months ago, we launched M&A Unplugged with the sole purpose and mission of helping people get smart about what it takes to really exit a business so you can maximize your returns and minimize your risks. And if you're looking to buy, how you can really be prepared so that when you do make that acquisition, you've got peace of mind around you know, consummating that transaction. And it's been a great ride. I don't know exactly what your experience has been podcasting, but I, I, I've, it's brought me so many other things. Uh, it's been a great ride. We, we love it. And it's actually launched a new business for us that now is solely focused on helping people prepare. Sun Acquisitions focuses on the transaction. Our new business, K2 Advisor, is all about helping people prepare. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, Landon and I spend a lot of time working with, with the business owners that we work with on tr transferring value from their business balance sheet to their personal balance sheet, mm -hmm. right? And I'm sure you guys have spoken about this on your podcast and you certainly speak to people about this, business owners about this all the time in that that actually puts you in a better position to negotiate when it is time to actually sell your business because you're not needing that transaction. It's that, you know, you've done what you're supposed to to actually have that transaction come, come to fruition, but you don't need it to be able to meet your financial goals that you have as an individual. Yeah, that's a great service that you're offering to people. And I think you hit the nail on the head. You know, if you can shore up your personal financial situation, you have all the leverage and none of the pressure. And now you can move forward and do a deal with a clear conscience. Uh, whereas, unfortunately, as you probably know, so many business owners need the proceeds of that acquisition, that, that sale to fund whatever it is they're going to do next, whether that's retirement, a new business, uh, whatever it is. And um, when you've got that much pressure on you, it even heightens uh, the need to, to be prepared uh, to bring that business to the marketplace. Yeah. Yeah. We've, we've found that uh, in working with business owners that lots of investment advisors will come out of the woodwork six months before you're ready to sell your business. But Landon and I want, in, want business owners to engage our services three to 10 years before they exit the business so that they're actually ready when it comes time 
rather than just saying, hey, we're here to help you manage those proceeds, like you said, for buying another business or retiring. Uh, there's so much preparation that really should go into what a business owner is doing. Yeah, without a doubt. I, I, we say the same thing. Uh, you know, we, we look at uh, an exit um, from uh, uh, three legs of the stool and the first leg being your personal financial situation. That's always where we start with owners. Do you know your exit number? Uh, how, do you have all your estate issues in order? And uh, invariably, we're always, you know, trying to get them to go and speak to their wealth manager or find a wealth manager to start that process and get an estate attorney to start that process. Because for, from my perspective, that really is the first leg of the stool before you get to how do you improve business value? And then the last leg being, are you emotionally ready? Uh, and, yeah. and how do you know when you're emotionally ready to move on? Because... As I, as I stated earlier, 75% of people fail to prepare. There are also statistics out there that 75% of business owners that sell their businesses are remorseful. And it had nothing to do with how much money they received for the business and everything to do if they weren't really prepared for the next stage of life. So yep. preparation is not just about the business, which is what we focus on. But it's got, like you said, your piece, which is, are you financially ready? And then the back end piece, what happens the day after you sell the business? Do you have something to go towards? Yep. Yeah, when that, after that day after, you know, when your phone stops ringing and people stop depending on you and this role that you have assumed for one, two, three, four decades, all of a sudden evaporates into thin air. I mean, that's just it's just almost something you just can't plan for because th there just isn't any, anything in the world that you can do to, to mimic that feeling and that experience. And it uh, it's pretty, it's powerful. Yeah, it is. Yeah. You got, you got a void there. And if you haven't built a plan well in advance of how you're going to fill that void. And I have some friends uh, that are going through this personally, where they built really substantial businesses and sold them. And, um, and they're young. I mean, we're, we're, I'm in my late 50s, and my friends are about my age. And they, they just didn't have the next thing. And they've been scrambling for the next thing. And it's hard. I mean, early, you know, late 50s is still very young. Uh, and there's a lot still for these folks to contribute to the world. And, uh, and now they're scrambling to figure it out. Yeah, yeah, well, I am very, very excited to have you on for uh, multiple reasons, uh, uh, personal as, as well. But uh, we, we've had a lot of people on the show uh, that have helped talk us through um, more the, the sell side, right? You know, we've had some attorneys and some business consultants and, and you know, an exit uh, planner and they are, have been wonderful guests and we've learned a lot from them and, and had some great experience with them, but we haven't really talked a lot about the acquisition side. So I'm super excited to dig into that with you. And if I understood what you said, um, you, the business that you, that you currently own and manage right now, did you say that you actually purchased that business? I did. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So one of the things that we wanted to pick your brain on um, that we know for sure our, our listeners will get a lot of value from is, is talking about, you know, how do you, how do you maximize the value, reduce the risks, not when you're selling a business, but when you're, when you're looking to acquire one? Yeah. Yeah. I have to tell you, um, it's a great question because a lot of the conversation around this usually does center around sellers and in not, not enough attention goes to buyers. And um, it's such an important topic because I've been speaking a lot recently about the merits of buying an existing business versus starting one from scratch. I'm a little biased here, right? So big disclaimer here. But having been, you know, someone who's bought my own business and helped hundreds of people buy businesses, I think there's real value in buying an existing ongoing operation versus starting something from scratch. I mean, when you think about starting a business, the statistics are horrible, right? 
over 50% uh, failure rate inside of three years. You get out to five years, you've got an over 75% failure rate and you weren't bringing in any income along the way. So you were having to self-fund your lifestyle, the business, trying to figure everything out. Whereas if you buy an existing business, you know, if, if you buy the right one for you, it should be turnkey, right? You're getting revenues, you're getting clients, trained employees, a product that's proven in the marketplace, vendor relationships, and the list goes on and on. So while it may cost more to buy an existing operation, you're paying yourself an immediate return uh, because you can analyze historical performance. So that, you know, that being said, you know, folks that are looking to acquire a business, so important to start by taking an inventory of yourself, um, what you like to do, what you don't like to do. Uh, we talk a lot about passion. I'm, a, I'm on the fence about passion. Um, passion for me comes down to not so much the business that you own, but the tasks that you're gonna perform day in and day out. Uh, I'm part of an international coaching program called Strategic Coach. And one of the things that they coach around is unique ability. Focus on the things that you're great at that you love to do uh, and get rid of all the other things, even the things that you're great at, but you hate to do, get rid of it all, delegate it, find other people to do it. So being passionate about the things that you do, and you can apply that to a lot of different businesses, but understanding yourself, the sort of businesses that you think would fit for you, uh, what your criteria are. Do you want a management team? Um, uh, do you want real estate with the business union versus non-union you want a service you want a product you know think about all of those things uh, and also think about where are you likely to get a loan once you find the business right so if you've spent your life in retail and all of a sudden you wake up one day and say i want to own a manufacturing business chances are there's not a bank in the land that's going to lend you money for that acquisition so being realistic about where you could go, you know, leverage your talents and, and your equity to go secure debt financing to get a transaction done. So, it, you know, it's really doing all of that strategic planning as the first step before you ever launch. And then surrounding yourself with a tremendous advisory team, people who understand M&A. If, if you've never done transactions or you've only done a few transactions uh, in your career, you really want to make sure that you line up an M&A attorney, uh, an accountant that is familiar with M&A and an m and uh, advisory team or firm like, my, like ours. You know, so really getting yourself surrounded with folks who can give you great advice um, and, and, you know, make sure that you don't fall into the common pitfalls that are, you know, are so common in these deals. And there's a ton of pitfalls when you acquire businesses. So having the right team and building the right strategy for me is the starting point. Yeah, absolutely. That's, uh, that is some invaluable advice. So you mentioned pitfalls. Um, I want to dig into that and I want to talk about in your experience, you know, how do you guide people to help them maybe insure is too strong of a word, but to ensure they don't buy the wrong business. So I, I, I definitely want to dig into that um, a little bit more, but you just said something that I wanted to comment on and um, now it's slipping my mind. So anyway, um, so let's, can you expound upon that a little bit? Help us, help us and our listeners understand you know, what, what do you need to look out for? What are some things that you need to consider? What do you need to do to make sure that if you're going to go out and buy a business that, you know, it, it's, it's going to be the right fit for you and for what you're looking to accomplish with it? Yeah. So, you know, what, obviously understanding what your goals and objectives are long-term, right? You know, what kind of business you want to operate? Are you, are you going to hold it for a long period of time? Do you have kids that maybe you'll bring into the business somewhere down the road? Or is an investment that, you know, you, you want to, you want to uh, uh, turn around sort of operation and then flip it three, five years from now. So there's a lot that, there's a lot of meat on that bone that, you know, we could go down, but you really have to understand what it is you want and then, you know, get out in the marketplace and start looking at opportunities, get educated 
I, I tell people, you know, cast a wide net at first uh, and look at a lot of deals and get educated. And by doing that, you'll sort of understand and refine your criteria uh, about what you're really looking for. You know, if you, if you look at one deal and then you go down the path to buy that one deal, you haven't really done a lot of market research. Now, that's not to say that doesn't work out for people. Sure it does. But, uh, you know, better method is go out and get smart. Look at a lot of deals. Do your research. Talk to friends that may be in industries that you're interested in. Get your, hand on, get your hands on research reports. Understand, you know, what's going on in that marketplace and whether or not business like that is going to be a fit for your profile, you know, what, what you like to do. Um, and then when you, when you do decide that, you know, you're going to get serious and you narrow it down to a sector or an industry or a couple of industries, go out and start networking. Um, get, talk to intermediaries like myself. Uh, there's a lot of business for sale websites out there that you, know, you can start looking at deals on. But I also think the real value is going out and networking and trying to get in front of owners of businesses. And that's one of the things that we coach people on or we do it for them. So if you're a first time buyer uh, or you just don't have the time to go do this, we'll actually go out and we'll make a market for you. So we'll identify 200 companies that fit your criteria after you've honed it and then we'll go and try to make that market for you and get owners who may be interested in selling, bring them to the table and bring you through the process. Or if you've got the time and the skill set to do it, you know, we'll coach you through how to do that so that you can then go do it yourself. Uh, and I think that's really where there's tremendous value in the marketplace, uh, especially right now. Believe it or not, this is a seller's market. And I know that may sound a little crazy given what's gone on with COVID, but there are so many buyers in the marketplace because of the low interest rates um, so, and all the money on corporate balance sheets. So if it's a company looking to acquire, you know, there, there's a lot of leverage there for them. Or if you're an entrepreneur, you have a small investor group, chances are maybe you've been downsized or fur furloughed or your job has changed so dramatically that you know, you're getting pushed to go out and maybe acquire a business. And we're seeing so many of these people right now. So there's a lot of competition mm -hmm. for the few businesses that actually hit some of those business for sale websites, which is why I say going out and creating your own market is really where the value is uh, in acquisitions. Yeah, yeah, super, super interesting. Um, maybe just before we move on from that topic, what are maybe one or two um, resources that you could point people to, to look at deals, to do further research into different markets, you know, anything like that? Yeah. So, you know, uh, lot, believe, it or not, believe it or not, libraries are a tremendous source of free information. Um, it, sometimes the libraries with your membership will give you access to research platforms completely free. Mm -hmm. that companies like ours pay thousands and maybe tens of thousands of dollars for every year to get access to. So I always tell people, go to your library, find out what digital assets are available through your membership and see if you can access some of that stuff. So for example, Reference USA. Um, some libraries offer Reference USA free of charge to members, library members. Well, we pay thousands for access to that on an annual on an annual basis, and you can see companies who the owner is, how many employees, their annual revenues. You can get a lot of information from Reference USA. Um, the other thing is the National NAICS uh, database. Uh, NAIC NAICS is the numerical. Um, cataloging of businesses inside of sectors. So manufacturing has a two digit code and then inside of manufacturing, there are literally 
hundreds of categories inside of manufacturing that get you to a six digit code. So you can research within manufacturing all these different sectors so that you can start to do your homework to figure out, well, you know, that, that might be an interesting sector or this might be, or I'm not interested in this, or I'm not interested in that. So I think that the NAICS code database is a great way to do some high level research on industries, sectors, and, you know, really drill down um, uh, quite a bit. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, one thing that I, I think is, and I want to make sure that I, I, I have this right, but one thing that I think is really, really interesting about uh, your your firm is that I believe you guys, you guys kind of specialize in dealing with companies between two and about 50 million of revenue. Is that accurate? Yeah, we, we actually say enterprise value, meaning- okay. Okay. You know, the, the, the purchase price, the enterprise value of the business. So between two and 50, that's our, that's our sweet spot. Okay. Yeah. And, and most firms that kind of do what you do, they typically, you know, don't seem to be interested in deals under, you know, 10 million of enterprise value. So uh, I think the fact that you're serving, you know, that uh, two to $10 million enterprise market uh, value uh, group. I, I think that that is um, is great because there's so many businesses that really need high quality advice in that arena, and uh, for you guys to be serving them, I think that uh, yeah, yeah, I think that's I think that's wonderful. Yeah, if you look at Landon, if you look at our marketplace uh, and, and intermediaries like us, you know, you've got I think three categories of intermediaries. You've got the, the really high end investment banking firms that really won't look at deals sub 30 million of enterprise value. They might not even go below 50. I mean, you're, their deal fees typically are started a million dollars and work their way up from there. So big investment banking firms are not looking at deals between two and 30 to 50 million. Um, so that that's one group of advisor on the low end are uh, business brokers um, and, and they tend to uh, focus more on mom and pops and really small businesses, you know, a couple of hundred thousand in revenue up to a million maybe. And there could be some folks that have some sophistication in that market, but they tend to be one, two, three man shops. And the, the person that's gonna represent you does everything. We sort of fit in that middle level of the market where there's not really a lot of us out there where you know, we're servicing a more sophisticated client uh, that's not going to get an investment banking firm to come down and do it. You're not going to get a business broker to manage it. Uh, yet, you know, we operate a lot like an investment banking firm. Our advisors have real support behind them, diligence support and marketing and business development. So, you know, we've built an infrastructure behind are advisors who actually work with the business owners day in and day out. So we've tried to bring the investment banking model down into this middle part of the market that uh, is probably pretty underserved. Yeah, very cool. I think this is a great spot to take a quick break uh, to hear from our sponsor, and then we'll come back and ask you a little bit more about uh, how to avoid some mistakes in buying businesses and to make sure we're really ready when, we're, when we wanna pull that trigger. Great. Whether you're an established local company or a brand new startup, you can count on GBS to be part of your family. We're not just any benefits consulting firm, we're GBS. We have nearly 30 years of experience in group benefits, a strong sense of purpose, and it shows. GBS, believe in something better. GBSbenefits.com. All right, tycoons, welcome back. We're here with Dom Rinaldi from m and Unplugged and Sun Acquisitions out of uh, the less than sunny uh, Chicago, Illinois area today. But uh, Dom, I, before we jump in a little to uh, some of the other questions we have for you about how to avoid mistakes going forward, there was something that kind of made my ears perk up and I, I saw it on Landon's face. I thought he was going to address it and he didn't. So I'm going to go back to a comment that you made about being emotionally ready to sell a business, right? 
And, uh, you know, one of the things that Landon and I talk about is being financially and emotionally ready to sell that business. And, uh, and I'll just throw this out there so that if you have business owners or if anybody who's listening to this, we do have kind of a questionnaire that we'll send businesses through called the Business Exit Readiness Index. And it talks not just on the financial side, but on the emotional side to find out, are you both financially and emotionally ready to exit your business? And if not, what do we need to do to get you there? That's awesome. That sounds like a tremendous resource. Yeah. So definitely if that's something that, you know, you see a, a benefit for reach out to us, we'd be happy to, to help your, help your clients go through that. Absolutely. Yeah. See, this, this is why Austin and I are good partners because earlier when I said there was something I wanted to mention, but it slipped my mind, <laughs> that's what I was going to mention. So thank you, Austin. Yeah. Yeah, I saw your eyes light up when he said emotionally ready because those are that's a term that Landon and I use all the time, but we don't hear it much in the marketplace. So it, it is it was uh, something that made you know a light bulb go off for me. So um, one thing I wanted to ask, well, actually one more comment. So you were talking about you know going out there and, and either creating a market or looking at a broad number of businesses, and that makes me think of you know when you're buying a, a used car or a new car or you're buying a house, you don't just look at one, right? And, and I think you're probably alluding to the fact that a lot of people see this business and go, oh gosh, that's a great, that's a great opportunity. The cash flow looks good. And they kind of just hone in on that and they want to make that business fit inside the hole for them, right? But put that, you know, maybe it's a square peg in a round hole or whatever it is, but they're trying to make that fit. And I think that there's a lot of value in what you're saying and look at a bunch of different businesses. It doesn't even look at a bunch of different industries. Even it doesn't have to be a specific business. It exploring will help you to be able to hone in on, on what, uh, what you should be looking for. Yeah. And I'm going to take it to, to a whole nother level. You know, you, you run the risk of having your heart broken after spending a lot of money, you go down the path with one entity and you start pouring all your resources and energy into that one thing. And I just had this happen to a client of ours. Uh, he found an opportunity. It, it, it's a discreet opportunity. And he, he really didn't want to broaden the search. And he went down the path and he invested a month and a half into this only to have the owner uh, pull the business out from under him um, and, and out from the market completely. And so, but he had invested a ton of time and effort and money because he had lawyers draft letters of intent. And so my take on this is to know that you're getting a great deal if you're in the acquisition mode, you should be parallel processing three to six deals at the same time and bringing them all down the path and then deciding you know, which one or ones might make the most sense and taking it even to the next step before you really start spending a ton of money. When you think about it, it's no different than when somebody sells a business, right? When they bring a business to us to sell, our goal is to find them as many buyers confidentially as we can and bring them as many offers as we can. So they have leverage and they can court the buyers and figure out who's the best fit. And it's, by the way, not always about the, the, the highest purchase price because there's so many other deal terms that go into it. Uh, but they're, they now have all the leverage because there's multiple buyers bidding for their business. When you're a buyer, I, I wouldn't approach it any other way. You should be looking to do the same thing. The challenge that most buyers have, though, is they don't have the time or expertise to do that. So they're stuck. And that's where we try to help them get unstuck, whether it's we do it for them or we coach them on how to get it done. Um, and, you, you know, you have to be ready because it takes a lot of time to do this. But that is really the best way to go get the best value uh, in the market. Yeah. So, I mean, you kind of hit on it there, the, the importance of working with an advisor like yourself or an intermediary like yourself to, to help find this business. But maybe expound upon that a little bit. I mean, why, why do you think it's really important for somebody who's looking to buy a business that they engage a, a, a firm like, your, like yours to help them find the proper business and, and really avoid the mistakes that, that are possible in buying the wrong business. 
Yeah, and so I mean, just to uh, make sure my, I'm making my comments clear, yes, you know, we do we do recommend if you haven't done this before, you probably should look at you know hiring us. Not everybody can afford to hire us, which is why we have another service where we'll coach you through how to do it. So we're sort of teaching you how to do what we do, but then you have to be able to go out and execute on that. So, but regardless get the the real advice here is have experts behind you that know how to do this right when people retain us they retain us because they just don't have the time uh to go do it um and 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 they just have no expertise and they're afraid of making mistakes so they bring us in and they have us run the process for them uh and and we usually can save people time money and we prevent all the pitfalls. And when I say all the pitfalls, it's amazing when you buy a business, how many pitfalls there are along the way. It's, it's crazy. So you really need to have um, good folks behind you to keep you, you know, out of making those mistakes. Yeah. I mean, and you can obviously disagree or, or, uh, you know, give me a, a different answer, but I think that one of the things that gets missed an awful lot in act in acquiring a business is not really understanding what you're looking at for the financials or the operations of the business. And if you don't, if you're not comfortable enough, or you don't know well enough what to look for, you're going to find yourself in trouble. Yeah. Yeah, you, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, and it, and it even starts before that, Austin. It starts from a lot of people don't even know how to engage or approach an owner. Questions to ask them, how to do discovery, how to build rapport with an owner, which is critically important to getting deals done, building rapport with the, with the owner of the business. And then how to look at financials, how to normalize them, how to value the business, looking at like transactions in that industry to understand, you know, are you making a market offer? Uh, and what sort of terms should you be offering? So it's not just so much the purchase price, but are you going to cash the seller out? Are you going to ask the seller to carry a seller note? Is there going to be an earn out component? Are there carve outs? You know, and the list goes on and on and on throughout every stage right in the diligence and knowing how to conduct diligence and how to keep the deal on on path and so you're right but certainly being able to to look at financials and understand what you're you know what you've got in front of you is of critical importance yeah hey austin if i can just jump in sorry i don't, I don't mean to interrupt i just wanted to mention something before i before it slips my mind because uh dominic i think what you just uh mentioned is so uh, important. And really, I actually just finished uh, listening to this book on tape. Uh, it's called Buy Then Build. And it's by a guy named Walker Diebel. Mm -hmm. And uh, his whole philosophy that he teaches and coaches people on is essentially what we're talking about today is, is buying, you know, an infrastructure, buying an existing build uh, business as opposed to starting one and, and building it from scratch. And I think uh, what you said about when you're approaching, uh, when you're approaching a seller, um, and I, I kind of had this mindset shift because uh, I'm starting to think about, uh, you know, buying a, a business myself outside of what I do. And it helped to kind of change my mindset because you, you think that when you go into to a deal, you know, and you're looking to acquire a business, it's like, well, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to, I'm going to grill this owner, you know, because I I'm in the driver's seat. And he talks about really shifting your mentality to where it's such a better approach to sit down and almost, it's almost like you, he, he says, you approach it as if you are interviewing for CEO mm -hmm. of the company, which I, I really liked, which is kind of, a spinoff of what you just mentioned, right? You gotta, you gotta get into rapport with these owners because ultimately, uh, you know, having a good relationship with, with the buyer and 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 getting into rapport with them, I think is, is really important to help lead to a much more successful outcome. So I'd love to, you know, hear your your thoughts on that, or if you have any other uh, yeah. points uh, worth uh, mentioning. 
I'll tell you why this is so important. Um, every deal hits speed bumps, right? Now I've been doing this 17 years. The business has been around for over 20 years, hundreds of deals. I haven't seen a deal in all of my years that doesn't hit a speed bump. And in many cases, they hit many speed bumps. If you don't have a level of rapport between the buyer and the owner of that business, so that when there's a speed bump, those two people can come together and work through the speed bump. Um, if there's an acrimonious relationship, you're never going to get past the speed bump ever. So your deal is dead on arrival. If your, your position going in is I'm in the driver's seat as the buyer, seller's got to prove themselves to me. That's just not the way to approach it. You need to have the rapport. You're going to hit speed bumps and you need to, you need to be able to work through that. Now, there are some speed bumps that are material that probably should kill the deal, but many are not material. They just need to be understood. And maybe there's a renegotiation of the deal or there's a, a change in the structure because of that speed bump. Um, but you need to, you need to have the ability to talk mano a mano with the, with the owner and be able to get past it. And here's the other reason why rapport really matters. Post-transaction, you might need that seller somewhere down the road mm -hmm. because you might hit something in the business that you, know, you haven't seen or the employees can't help you with. You need to be able to pick up the phone and call the previous owner and say, hey, listen, this has happened. In the 20 or 30 years that you own the business, did this ever happen or anything like it? And what advice would you give me? You have a great relationship with that owner. They're going to pick up the phone. They're going to talk to you. You know, they're going to do everything they can to try to help you because that's their legacy. Whereas if yep. you have an acrimonious relationship, chances are they're not going to pick up that phone and they're not going to care. Um, yep. So really matters that you, you have good rapport between the parties. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more there. I mean, you know, some of the training that Landon and I have recently gone through in in helping businesses exit, um, you know, one of the guys that that taught some of the classes that we took used the terminology that they you want to both sides should be equally unhappy when the when mm -hmm. the transaction's done. I'm not sure I like that, but you get the point, right? Whether it's equally unhappy or equally happy, or it makes me think of Stephen Covey, where it should be a win 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 scenario, yeah. right? right. And, and, and that's, it couldn't be any more true, right? Because yeah. you're absolutely right. There could be something that comes up after the, the fact, and you want to be able to call that owner and say, did you ever see this? Right. You know, exactly. you, they, exactly. they're selling you, like you said, their legacy. They yeah. want to give you something that's good. They want to receive fair compensation for it. But you as the acquirer, you're buying that business based on what you believe it can do in terms of future cash flows and future opportunity for you. You're both on the same page. You're both trying to accomplish the same thing. There's no reason for it to be, like you said, acrimonious or confrontational. Absolutely. That's right. And, you know, and, and, and not to bolster our position in, in these deals, but being an intermediary, sometimes we can help the parties get through that, right? We can deliver bad news, we can handle the bad news. So there's a buffer that allows that rapport to re, you know, remain while we work through whatever the speed bump is um, because they, they're going to happen. They absolutely are going to happen. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to ask you a question on, on Landon's behalf. So Landon just said that he's looking at a potential acquisition of a business He's looking at something completely outside of what he does or what we do uh, in our practices. Um, so if you're taking Landon, for example, and you're saying, I think I want to buy a business. I've got some money. I'll probably finance some of it, whether it's seller financed or I do bank financing or an earn out or whatever. What's step one for Landon to, to prepare himself for that opportunity? Yeah. So, you know, Landon and to anybody else who's in this position, we actually built a uh, acquisition readiness um, assessment that's online, takes you less than five minutes. We recommend that people take that assessment as a starting point. When you take that assessment, you're going to get 
the results email to you immediately and it's gonna give you a score between zero and 100. We're gonna email the questions and the answers to you. And it's gonna be pretty obvious based on the questions that we asked you and your answers, where the gaps are in your acquisition strategy and the things that you should be addressing before you ever get to market. And so Austin, the, the reality is, is that the, those starting points or the things that people need to address are different from person to person, right? Depending on their skills and their background and what they've done. And so this assessment is designed to highlight the really high level key parts that somebody needs to be prepared for. And if they're not, then we recommend, you know, let's do a consult and let's talk you through what you need to do to, to close those gaps and get prepared. And I really believe strongly that, you know, spending that time up front before you actually get out there and start searching for businesses is well worth your time and your effort. Because then when you do get to the marketplace, it will enable you to act very quickly because it's a very competitive marketplace, as I mentioned earlier, and you do need to act quickly. So when you find the right deal, you don't want to be fumbling for, oh my God, where am I going to get this loan from? You've already, identi you've already identified lenders. You already know what your borrowing capability is. You already have a sense of what the loan packages might look like. So you've got pieces in place so that you can act very quickly. You've got an attorney. You know the attorney can gin up a, a letter of intent and offer template for you very quickly. You don't have to go find an attorney, spend time explaining what's important to you. You've done all that ahead of time. And there's probably you know, 25 things like this that you need to be doing before you ever get to market. So to put a bow on it, my recommendation to land is go take our assessment, see where your <laughs> gaps are, and then let's address the gaps first before you actually start looking. Yeah, I love that. You know, you're, you're preaching to the choir here. It's kind of like the, uh, the business owner that uh, approaches his CPA and says, hey, um, I just sold my business. Can we do some tax planning work now? <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> no, sorry, it's too late. You got, you know, you have to do that stuff on the front end to uh, be able to be, you know, strategic and tactical in, in, in uh, implementing stuff. And, and uh, so, yeah, right. I, we, we love that. Um, so we're, we're starting to press up against time here, but I want to um, make sure that we, we chat about something here for a couple minutes. So you talk about having a, a self-managing business, you know, without having to start from scratch. So what does that mean? And talk to us a little bit about that, if you would, please. Yeah. So what's a self-managing business? A self-managing business is a business that can operate without the owner's direct involvement in any of the operations on a day in day out basis. Uh, why is that important? Why is that something that you should be shooting for? Right. We all own businesses because we want to run them. Um, that's, that's great, but, the more that you're a cog in the wheel in any part of the day-to-day -day operations, the less valuable your business is in the marketplace. And the simple reason for that is that introduces risk for the new owners of that business. Now that means that the owners have to come in and actually perform a task that you're performing today without all the experience and knowledge that you have over however many years you've operated the business, that introduces risk. Whenever there's risk, values go down. So the, the most uh, de-risked sort of transaction is when the owner can sit above the business and work on it strategically and not be required to do anything in the business day in and day out. And it's a really hard thing to do uh, and it takes time you know, it's not going to happen day one, but it should be something that you work towards every day, every month and every year. And when you get there, I promise you the rewards are pretty amazing. I actually operate a self-managing business and it is so much fun. I get to do the things that I love to do every day and I don't have to worry about being a cog in any of the wheels day in and day out. And, uh, 
but 10 years ago, I couldn't have imagined that. Uh, I was the, I was the rainmaker of our firm. And I realized that, you know, I had to take some of my own medicine here and, and start to build my own self-managing business. And it took me a long time finding the right people that you trust, that you can train the right way that are going to make the decisions the way you make them or make them in a way that's going to enhance the business, right? So maybe it's not your way, but it enhanced the business, right? So maybe their way, but it enhanced it. It's hard, but it's well worth the effort. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> it sounds like you're kind of helping them to shift their mindset a little bit from, you know, from the business owner that wears 17 different hats to really approaching their business at, as an investment, right? If, if I go out and I buy a stock, right? And I add that stock to my investment portfolio, I don't, I have nothing to do with the business operations. I don't make any decisions. I just sit back and hopefully watch it grow, right? And to be able to get to a point like that in your business, um, I'm not there in my own business. Uh, so I don't know the direct feeling, but we do coach people and, and, and try to help people understand kind of what you're referring to is, is de-risking their business because uh, as one guy puts it, uh, this guy, uh, Josh Patrick, he's a, um, a guy in our space that uh, does a lot of, of work with business owners. And uh, Josh talks about making yourself operationally irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And I, I love that term because when you, when you get to that point in your business, uh, the things that it, that it does and the impact that it has on your business from a valuation standpoint is pretty, pretty phenomenal. Yeah, with no doubt about it. Uh, I'd say it's one of the top things the owner of a business can do to increase the value of their business. Yeah, I'll ask yeah. one follow-up question, Austin, and I'll pass it back to you. So in this space, you know, in this, let's say the, I don't know, let's say the two to 10 million enterprise value space, Dominic, are there businesses that you can buy that, that are self-managing in that space? Or does that not exist until you get up into the 20, 50, hundred million dollar, you know, business values? Absolutely exists without a doubt. No doubt about it. Yep. I see it all the time. I don't see enough of it, but I do see it without a doubt. Two to 10 million. Yeah. I'm sure it's certainly less common, but yeah, I'm, I'm sure it exists. And mm -hmm. it does. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you get below 2 million of enterprise value. Chances are that it, it, you know, it's very hard to find businesses that are self-managing below that threshold, but 2 million of enterprise value, you've got a little bit of infrastructure there. Um, there, there should be teams of people that are running the business day in and day out. And then the only question is, you know, was that owner able to let go? Right. That's really the biggest thing, right? It's uh, look, we all own our own businesses right here. We're sort of a type personalities, I'm guessing. Right. And eight, <laughs> it's the sort of makeup of most business owners. And uh, we we want to have our hands in the pot. We want to know what's going on and letting go uh, is really a hard thing. But boy, the rewards on the other end uh, are tenfold, maybe 20, 30 fold. It's it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's something we try, you know, Landon said, we talk to our clients about doing it all the time and it's hard because from an ego standpoint, it's hard to let it go. Well, well no, I'm, I am, you mentioned the rainmaker. I'm the rainmaker. Why would I turn that over to anybody else? Nobody right. can do it better than me. Yeah. Right. Nobody preaches the gospel of my business better than I do. But if you can let that go, like you said, and literally just be up above that business and look at the strategic aspects of the business and try to push it forward. Great. But the day-to-day -day operations should be, be run by somebody else because your value goes way up. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, I will tell you, I mean, your example right there, an owner that is the rainmaker or is involved in sales in a meaningful way. I promise you, your value of your business is a lot lower than if you didn't have any involvement. Or even if it's not lower, the way that you're going to get paid out for the purchase price is going to be over a very long period of time because there's so much risk there. You know, yep. all the clients, you know, all the customers, you may go to golf or dinner or events with them way too much risk for a new owner to take on. They're going to, 
they're going to devalue that business for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll tell you what, Dom, I think we could talk to you for another two hours. We've got plenty of questions we could ask and, and we'll certainly have to have you come back on the show in another six months or a year to, to update us on where you are. But you know, for our listeners and for people that, that you'll share this with, tell us how to get a hold of you. Tell us where to follow your, your podcast, your website, LinkedIn, all that kind of stuff so that people can get in touch with you. Yeah. So the easiest way to get a hold of me is via email. It's D Rinaldi, D R I N A L D I at sunacquisitions.com. Uh, and if you want to check out the free resources that I mentioned, uh, you can go to our, uh, our other sister company, k2advisor.com. That's K, the number two, A-D-V-I-S-E-R.com. And uh, m and Unplug, the podcast is available on our websites. Uh, and it's also on all of the major podcast platforms. Great. Well, thank you so much for being on the program. Hopefully, uh, it wasn't a major step down from the way that you host your podcasts, but we appreciated the conversation. Uh, not at all, guys. It was an absolute pleasure to be here. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Our, Thanks, Tom. It's our pleasure. Thank you so much. You've been listening to Tycoons of Small Biz, proudly hosted by Austin Peterson and Landon Mance. Austin and Landon are comprehensive financial planning professionals specializing in financial, estate, and succession planning for small business owners. Austin and Landon have offices in Scottsdale, Arizona, and Las Vegas, Nevada, and represent clients in 14 states throughout the country. Join Austin, Landon, and the Featured Tycoons live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. right here on Business Radio X and your favorite podcast platform. Mm-hmm. <laughs>